please try to have lunch during this session or whenever it's convenient for you. And session four, the symposium on uh, will be all uh, A, which is in the fifth floor. In the fifth floor. So uh, we will have the live inbox tower by Dr. Christopher Nalan. Thanks, Chairperson. You can visit or you can come and watch it from home. Hi, uh, good morning from uh, Yorkshire in the UK. I hope you are having a great conference and you've recently celebrated Holy. My name is Chris Malkin. I'm an interventional structural cardiologist working in Leeds. And I've been asked to present um, a live in the box case to demonstrate TAVI in the UK using the self-expanding Medtronic Evolute product. Um, for those of us that do TAVI, we have moved on from just hoping that we get the valve uh, working in the body. Um, it's not just getting good hemodynamics with no leak. We're now interested in durability. We're interested in making sure that conduction disturbance, coronary access, and the future options for revalving are all in play. And that requires some specific maneuvers at the time of implant. Um, this phenomenon of implanting the valve using a cusp overlap technique um, is one method that allows us to do that. That gives you a one-to-one -one appreciation of the annulus and the outflow tract and allows you to implant the valve higher in the outflow tract and reduces the risk of heart block and left bundle branch block. And secondly, knowledge of the anatomy of the patient into the delivery catheter of the valve allows you to implant the valve much as a surgeon would do with commissure alignment of the TAVI valve closely approximated to the commissures of the patient's valve. And that's critical for being able to revalve the patient in the future and for reaccess. And it's, it's critical to know how the anatomy of the patient and the fluoroscopic relationships of the TAVI valve fit together. On the left panel that you can see, the commissure of the TAVI valve is directly approximated to the C-tab of the loading capsule, and that's at a 90 degree parallel to what's called the C-paddle. So you can see on the cartoon in the center panel, you have the um, C-paddle and the hat are at 90 degrees to us. And only by knowing that and knowing where you are fluoroscopically in the patient, can you get the commissure of the TAVI valve to implant next to the commissure of the patient's valve. And that involves working in this so-called cusp overlap view where the left and right commissures are overlapped. And that means on the right side of the screen is the left right commissure of the patient. And on the right side of the screen will be the commissure of the TAVI valve. And there are some very simple maneuvers that you need to know, which is for this product anyway, you introduce the valve system into the body with the flush port at three o'clock. And you have to work in this so-called ario cordal cusp overlap view that you see on the right side, where the LVOT is seen one-to-one -one fluoroscopically rather than foreshortened. And um, in the cath lab, what you see, of course, is this. You don't see the valve, you don't see the commissures, you have to rely on your CT that you've done beforehand to know where you're working. And you can see the uh, hat marker in the lower red circle and the C tab on the right side of the screen and the top circle. This valve is going to expand with its commissures next to the commissures of the patient. Now, when you deploy the valve, what you should see in the ario cordal cusp overlap view is the C tab on the far right of the screen. And this valve has been implanted preserving commissural alignment. And this is important for two reasons. One is these long valves with superannular leaflets can, if they're implanted anti-anatomically, i.e. without commissural alignment, can they, they can stop you being able to reaccess the coronaries. But perhaps even more importantly, they can prevent you from revalving the patient. If the commissural comes above towards the sinotubular junction, then another valve inside it could cause sequestration of the coronaries which would lead to real patient harm. So I'm now going to share a case uh, with you. 
which is a live in the box case. And that should be playing now. So I'll just turn the volume down. So this is a case that uh, I performed with my colleague, Dr. Cunnington. So uh, on, on the right panel, you can see the cath lab. Now this is a, a very a, a high volume modern TAVI center in the UK. Um, it's a light touch procedure. Uh, there is no anesthetist in the room. There's a, a nurse looking after the patient. There are two consultant operators working with a scrub nurse. The patient is not sedated. The patient's awake and you'll hear me talking to her later. Um, I remember the patient very well. She was 78. Uh, she had some comorbidity. She was intermediate surgically risked, um, but, but had very good transfemoral options. And we elected to use a self-expanding device because she had very, very small anatomy with an annulus of around 18 and a half millimeters. Uh, she had relatively light calcification on the valve, but she had a large uh, septal bulge with an eccentric and even smaller LVOT. The sinuses, as you can see in this aortogram, were reasonably capacious, so we had no concerns about uh, coronary jailing. Um, and you can see that the hemodynamics on the right show that she had very significant hypertension. She had a very small LV cavity, so almost a sort of paradoxically low flow physiology with a, a relatively small invasive gradient, but actually hemodynamically it was having a significant effect on her. She was very symptomatic. And we felt that in this case, a supravalvular, a, a, a superannular valve would be the key for her, giving her the best possible hemodynamic result. And in fact, that we calculated that an intraannular balloon expanding valve probably would leave her with a residual gradient and would almost certainly give either moderate or moderate to severe patient prosthetic mismatch. You'll also see on the right panel that it's a single groin access. So the uh, 16 French integrated evolute sheath is in the right leg. In the left leg, there is a, a needle in the skin that allows us to do LV wire pacing. Uh, and uh, we're just talking through the setup views here and just studying the hemodynamics. Now I'm going to wind forward a fraction. And I will turn the volume up. So we're now going through the regular maneuver uh, before any evolute valve uh, implants, you have to screen the valve to make sure that it is uh, loaded. Uh, this is one of our other nurses who's loaded the valve for us. So you have to fluoroscopically inspect the valve to check that the paddles are integrated into the uh, pockets. You can see that at the bottom of the screen and you inspect the braid of the valve to make sure that it's all aligned. We elected to do a direct implant in this case uh, so there's no pre-balloon valvular plasty. Uh, so my colleague here is taking out the, uh, the sheath that we've used to dilate the uh, common femoral artery and iliacs. And I'm gonna go straight in with the uh, delivery capsule, as you can see. Um, this video is not edited. It's, it, it's, uh, it, it was, we, we prepared it for some teaching sessions, but actually we never used this one. So, you can see that, I'll just turn the volume up, but um, there's a lot of chat between myself and my colleague about uh, what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it. And this is the real world of TAVI where you have to react to what you see. And uh, you, you, you can see how the case evolves now.
just turn the volume off. So if you look at uh, my hands there, I've got one, my left hand on the front of the delivery catheter, and I've got my right hand on the wire. This gives really fantastic control of the uh, valve and allows me to exert pressure both on the catheter and the wire. That, that can be very important. Secondly, this case was a bit of a challenge. The lady was so small, uh, 48 kilos, if I remember, she had a very severe radial spasm. And you can actually see that throughout the procedure, the, the, the marker pigtail is never perfectly at the bottom of the non-coronary sinus. And of course, that pigtail is the critical marker. So that presented some extra challenges for us. The other major problem was that there was a very wide pulse pressure. You can see that on hemodynamics. I think actually that the wire and catheter at the moment are actually causing more AR than she had to start with. Uh, so we use uh, a period of pacing. So initially moderate pacing of around 120 and then rapid pacing. You can see that going on in a few minutes uh, to, to, to get the valve absolutely fixed in our eye at the point of contact from the non-coronary side and the left coronary side. Finally, you can see how this implant is, is, is different really to how it was even three years ago. You start very, very high with the uh, delivery catheter only just below the pigtail and you allow the valve to slowly come down with inside it and this minimizes the engagement of the equipment in the LVOT and it's it's thought that that is one of the reasons that this implant technique reduces the risk of conduction disturbance. You can see that the valve is very high now it's deliberately very high and I'm allowing it to drift down into the desired position. So to those of you who've got a good eye at this, you, you think that the valve looks deep at the moment, but that's a, an illusion because uh, the pigtail is actually being pushed out of the sinus and, and, and the pigtail is floating about two, three millimeters high. Actually, my colleague's a bit, is a bit stressed about that, but actually see when I do a picture here, you can see that actually the, the valve is, is perfectly placed two or three millimeters below. We're gonna go for it now. And uh, we'll do a, pe a period of moderately fast pacing to get it. So um, this is a three-dimensional uh, structure, the valve and the patient. So you need two images to check the position. In this areocaudal position, we can only really confidently assess what we see as the left-hand side of the valve, the non-coronary side, which is on the pigtail side. We need to assess the other side of the valve. We do that by going LAO towards the coplanar three cusp view. And then we're able to assess the left coronary side of the valve. So two dimensional structures need two, sorry, 3D structures need two two dimensional images to assess them. And this looks perfect to me. It's about two to three millimeters on both sides. It's a really nice high implant. And um, I'm gonna keep pressure in my left hand um, to make sure that this delivery catheter is pushed towards the greater curve. And you'll see that I will pull the wire out significantly so that the wire is floating. So there's no retrograde or aortic force on the system that could potentially allow the valve to slip up. 
one of the things that we were worried about in this case was the very small, very small LVOT with a minor dimension of only 50 millimetres. We had some anxieties that that might allow the valve to slide up. So keeping that push on to the system until the very last moment. So there's no rush at this point. The valve is uh, expanding all the time. The, the, the temptation is you just want to finish the procedure, but actually this is the time to go very, very slow. The valve is in a perfect position. You don't want it to move. So um, we are just taking our time here. And my colleague is, you can see the tiny movements he's doing with his right hand just to bring the uh, delivery capsule off the paddles at the top of the valve, which is happening now. And I'm looking rigidly at the bottom of the valve to make sure that it is not moving. In fact, you will see that I had so much uh, push on the system that actually I've managed to get the, uh, the, the distal end of the capsule slightly engaged in the top of the cell. That's, that's quite common, it's not a problem. You just need to be able to spot that. And we're just uh, using the fluorosco fluoroscopy to make sure that we're confident it's completely off. So the worst thing to do at this stage is to pull it out just in case it's engaged in the top of the cell. So um, actually it is off, um, but the, the, th the thing to do is actually to rotate the catheter um, and eventually it just comes free by itself, as you can see there. Uh, again, there's no, there's no rushing at this point. Every, you can only adversely affect what should be a perfect result. So we keep LV access with the uh, preformed Safari wire recapture the, uh, um, the capsule and the nose cone, as you can see here. And then we'll take out the whole integrated system and reinsert a short 16 French cook. And if we need to do a post annotation, then we can do that, or perhaps we'll just assess the hemodynamics and see what the result is. You can see that even though it's a very high implant, you probably could not go higher. There's a few ectopics at the There is actually a bundle branch block. Um, it's still sinus. Um, so, you know, conduction disturbance is, is, is still a factor of, of TAVI implant, uh, but there's no major heart block. You probably missed that, but I was talking to the patient it's quite nice to talk to the patient during the procedure sometimes. So a lot of our patients are genuinely very interested in what we say and what we do. Oh, my colleague pulled the wire out. I told you this case wasn't perfect. I think that was a merely a factor of just the size of the LV cavity just allowed the LV wire to come out. And uh, uh, I, it's, it's uh, one of those unforgivable things in interventional cardiology is pulling the wire out. But uh, I, I, we do an aortogram now because uh, I was so sure that the valve result would be good.
So we see, we see I think uh, there is a bundle here with uh, normal PR relationship. There was a tr transient uh, period of isorhythmic dissociation. So um, AV dissociation, which I think was just junctional actually. You can see the result hemodynamically is good. The gradient has gone. There's, a, there's possibly a very tiny peak-to-peak uh, -peak gradient, but the LVEDP is still low. Aortic diastolic is good. The patient's still hypertensive, but that looks pretty good. So I'm going to do a pullback now. This is quite nice if you're a radial operator, you can use the femoral pigtail to um, pull the radial pigtail down the descending. It's quite a nice maneuver. I will just show you one uh, final thing, which is the aortogram in the REO caudal projection. Now, if you remember from my initial presentation, I said that if we were going to achieve perfect commercial alignment, the C tab, which you see here, should be on the right-hand side of the screen. You can see that we're actually about 15 degrees off, um, but uh, that should be enough to make sure that the commissure is at least 30 degrees away from the coronary. Uh, but to have it absolutely uh, perfect commissure of the patient to near commissure of the valve, the C tab should be on the inner curve on the right-hand side of the screen as you see it. So I will uh, stop the video just to say that this patient did very well. Uh, I saw her actually two or three months ago. She's in very good order. She did not need a pacemaker. She went home within 24 hours of the procedure. She was on her feet actually six hours later and went home uh, you know, at 20 hours after the procedure was finished. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that case. Uh, I don't know whether there were uh, any questions from the floor? I'll just quickly go back to a, a mini presentation. So the implant you saw was essentially the, the most contemporaneous way that we are implanting the evolute valve. This so-called cusp overlap technique was tested in the uh, proof of concept pro, pro, pro plus trial in the States, which is a all comers implant using this so-called optimized procedure using the REO caudal cusp overlap view. And in this uh, series, they show that performing evolute implant in an ARIO cordal projection does actually get the pacing rate way down from what it had been traditionally with core valve evolute devices. Um, in the evolute low risk trial, for example, the pacing rate was around 17%. But in this Pro Plus, um, using this just slightly modified implant technique that I've shown you in my case, the pacing rate was under 10%. And this was the CT of the patient you've just seen. You can see the LVOT in the top right panel with highly eccentric and very small. And um, you can see on the bottom the key things that you do need from your CT, which is the three cusp view on the left and the implant view, which is the REO caudal view on the right with the green and the red dots superimposed. And that is the working view that gives us the ability to do both the cusp overlap technique and commercial alignment in most patients. So that was a uh, one of my typical cases. It was a 23 millimeter Evolute Pro. I think this valve gave this patient the best possible hemodynamics. Uh, and I don't think she would have had such good results intra annular valve. She would have been left with a bigger gradient. 
It was a very light touch TAVI with non-GA, no sedation, single groin access. We saw a nice demonstration of a cusp overlap impl implant view in REO caudal with nearly perfect, but not quite perfect commercial alignment. And you saw it in real time. Um, and it, the, the whole procedure from skin to skin was about 45 minutes. And I think you saw around 25 minutes of that. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, have a very successful conference. I'm going to sign off now, I think. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Thank you very much. We all enjoyed the lecture. It's a very nice case, live box. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the delay that has happened. That's okay. Bye.